Hi everyone and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Genevieve Field and I'm the Dean of Teaching Programs at Ambition Institute. Formerly a school leader, I've been working with early career teachers uh, for about 10 years through roles in schools, skits, and now at Ambition Institute. For those of you who don't know us, Ambition Institute is an educational charity with a mission to help teachers and school leaders to keep getting better, uh, especially those who are working in the most disadvantaged communities. This session is part of our summer series, a program of webinars that we're running through the summer term to offer support to teachers and school leaders through and beyond the coronavirus pandemic. Today, we're gonna to be talking about how we can best support NQTs in the new academic year. Due to school closures, teachers starting their NQT year in September will have missed a significant chunk of their initial teacher training year. The summer term is often when teachers and trainees ramp up their classroom practice, applying their theoretical learning and gaining valuable classroom experience that will prepare them for their NQT year. Providers will have supported their trainings through this time and continued learning, and some will have continued their work in schools and even delivered lessons online. But despite this, we need to pay particular attention to this group of teachers to ensure they're well prepared and supported as much as possible and set up to thrive in their NQT and beyond. Therefore, schools will not only be thinking about how they might need to adapt their induction program to best support this new incoming uh, group of NQTs, with potential gaps in their learning, um, but also to support their well-being. So with continued uncertainty around what schooling is actually gonna look like in September, school leads are considering how this might affect the normal experience and learning of an NQT in their important first year of teaching. We're so lucky to have a fantastic lineup of panelists joining us today to talk about some key issues that are surround NQTs and I'm very grateful to Tanya, Emma, Lisa, and David for taking the time out of their really, really busy schedules to be with us. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to them to introduce themselves and to offer us just a brief opening remark. Um, if we can go to Tanya first. Hi everyone, I'm Tanya Abandon Hope. I'm a professor of education and provost at Plymouth, Mar Plymouth Marjon University. And I was delighted to be invited to take part in the discussion today. Um, I've been a teacher for 30 years, can't believe it's gone so quickly. And in that time, I've been a, a leader, teacher, teacher educator, and um, have, can't believe it's 20 years ago, um, supported the development of one of the first skits in the country and have been head of school for teacher education at uh, the University of Plymouth. Um, and at the moment, I'm working in a capacity with different schools across the country, particularly those that are coastal or rural, to understand what their needs are, um, but work uh, very closely on teacher recruitment and retention, and I'm a council member of the University Council for the Education of Teachers. Great, thank you so much, Tanya. Uh, Lisa? Hi, everybody. Uh, Lisa Fathers, Director of Teaching School and Partnerships at Bright Futures Educational Trust. Uh, so I'm the director of our teaching school, the Alliance for Learning. We have a skit, early years, primary and secondary, and a huge teaching school offer. Um, really a, a unique offer around health and well-being uh, and mental health. And I'm also a national trainer with Mental Health First Aid England and a co-chair the Greater Manchester Mentally Healthy Schools programme. So yeah, really, really happy to be here today. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Emma? Hi everybody, I'm Emma Hollis. I'm the Executive Director of NASBITS, which is the National Association for School-Based Teacher Trainers. We're a membership organisation that encompass, encompasses school-based initial teacher training and also teacher training beyond the initial year. Uh, our members are made up of SKITS, universities, teaching schools, school direct lead schools. I'm particularly uh, pleased to be invited today because across our membership, um, we train every year in excess of 10,000 teachers. So really kind of central to our thinking at the moment is how we support those teachers that are coming out of this year and heading into their NQT positions for September. Great, thank you so much, Emma. And last but not least, David. Hi, good afternoon everyone, I'm David. Um, currently 15 year teacher, historian by trade, uh, and head of department of the subject, currently part of my school senior team, uh, developing an NQT programme, second year and year three programme with responsibility for new staff. Great, thank you so much. Um, thanks for those introductions from our panel. Uh, we're gonna start our discussion with the three 
questions. Um, again, we're trying to keep these really nice and concise to leave us time for some questions from the audience at the end of our discussion. So through these three questions and while the panelists are sharing their views, if you have any question that you'd like as a follow-up or um, and as an aside, please pose it in the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom window now. We'll try to get through as many as we can in the time we have allotted. So over to question one. Um, so our, question, our first question is, what are the principles that underpin really great teacher development in normal times that are important to remember now? And if I can go to Emma first, please. Thank you. I think for me, it's around mentoring and quality mentoring and getting that right. And there's two strands for that for us. We talk a lot to our members about there being two strands of mentoring. On the one side, there's the named mentor. So there's the person who is named as the, the point of contact for your NQT, who will have had mentor training and who um, will be supporting that NQT in the one-to-one -one sessions. And for them, we need to make sure always, but particularly at the moment, that that role is really valued, really respected, that they feel fully trained, confident in their role, that they know what they're doing when they're supporting. There's going to be a lot of uncertainty for September. Um, and what we want is, while there might, might be uncertainty about how we're managing the pandemic, we want people who are really confident in supporting their NQTs in their development. So for them, they really need to be given time is the most important thing that mentors tell us they are very time poor. All teachers are time poor, but respecting that their role is not a bolt on. It's not something that they do in their spare time. It's, it's absolutely pivotal to developing your staff and making sure that you're um, developing your teachers to be the best they can be. Um, so they need that time to do it justice and also need to be given the tools to support their NQT effectively. But there's also something broader that I think school leaders um, and everybody in a, in a school environment can do, which is around mentorship, which is slightly different to mentoring. And I always think of developing a new teacher as you've got that kind of old hack phrase of it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes an entire school to raise an NQT. And it's about that uh, LSA who pops their head in the door when they see things aren't quite, quite going right and gives, gives a little thumbs up and checks up on them when they see them in the staff room later. Or the head teacher who makes sure there's a culture of collaboration and not a culture of competition, which means that people are willing to share their lesson plans with the NQT and not tuck them away and expect the NQT to do everything from, uh, from scratch. Um, it's about the, the conversations that take place in staff rooms, reassuring each other as to, you know, class nine on a Friday afternoon is really difficult. And here's some ways I've found to work with them that works really well for me. So there's the mentoring role, the individual who needs really excellent training and development and time, but there's also a culture development for mentorship across the whole school. And they're important all the time, but I think particularly as we go into this uncertain uh, period in September and beyond. Great, thank you so much, Emma. Um, Tanya, I'm really here, uh, curious to hear your views on this from a university and a SCIP provider. You're on mute, Tanya. I knew I was going to do that. Um, I couldn't agree more with Emma. The idea of um, the NQTs going in and not having full school support, particular, particularly in these times that are going to be so challenging. We don't know what it's going to be like in September. We've got some idea because we know that close have not been that schools have not been closed, that they have been open, that they've been receiving, supporting, facilitating the learning of the children, that they can they can do based on capacity. So the mentoring. Um, the collaboration, all very important. From a university perspective, uh, when we're training our teachers, we hope that we provide them with the praxis that they need to be able to be resilient and cope with challenging situations. And by praxis, I mean, it's the, the theory and the practice working together. So a teacher training programme will give them the understanding of why they do something in order to know how to do it. And I've been quite um, shocked and upset really by press coverage of the way in which um, losing part of their training has been seen to be such a deficit for NQTs going into schools in the future. Because actually, this could be our first generation of, of, of resilient NQTs who know how to respond to challenges and change in a way that other trainee teachers haven't had to face. So actually, they're going in with a, with a huge positive that seems to have been overlooked. And by giving them that grounding, that framework of praxis, we've actually set them up to succeed. 
So they know why things work the way they do. The theory has given them that understanding. They've had placement practices. They won't have had all of the placements that they were expecting to have because the majority of it does take place in universities in that third term. But the teaching didn't stop. At Marjon, our trainees were having uh, scheduled online lessons all the way through with simulations and understanding and talking to schools. So the connection was still there and that ability to apply the theory to the practice is going to hold them in good stead when they get there. They're going to be used to the challenges. They're going to be IT savvy. Their digital technology use will be fantastic and perhaps the NQTs that are coming through for 2020 are going to be leading the changes with a mixed economy of delivery which I suspect is going to take place and has to take place in all, school, all schools from September. Thank you so much um, and I'm really keen to get a school perspective on this. David? Uh, thank you. I, I couldn't agree more again with what Emma was saying about the the role of culture within a school. You know, it's really important that from senior leadership to NQTs that everyone's wanting to work together to get the best for the, pu for the pupils. And NQTs coming into the profession in September, you know, you're going to have some people that are coming back that'll be really keen because they've missed out on learning. They've got to remember that when they're coming back in, there'll be some, some fresh pupils that are looking forward to, to working with them. But I agree with the mentoring. At a school, in, in our school, we make sure that we really pair up we, our mentors, we raise their profile, they're really key, key leaders for us and their role with new staff is, is all open and it, there's no question too silly. I agree with what you were saying about coming in with these new uh, technical savvy teachers. It's an exciting time to come into the profession. Um, but I do think with, with the mentoring and having um, little and often mentor sessions in our school, we have a very much an open door policy where we say, look, let's let's share resources let's coach through problems let if you, we don't know the answers let's see what technology we can use in terms of supporting one another and it, it's it's important for those to remember although yeah like um tanya was saying they've not been in the classroom on their third placements you know they're coming back in let's if we say september they're coming back in and a school can take away some of their anxieties by supporting with routines what is consistent across the school can be shared with them so they can take away some of their maybe anxieties so that we can really work at honing in their, their enthusiasm for their subjects to pass on to the learners. And David, just um, do you have any advice for school leaders who, who are going to be grappling with um, trying to balance the need of needing all teachers establishing, re-establishing culture in a school and trying to get back to something that feels normal with the need to protect that release time for, for mentoring and mentorship of NQTs? Well, yeah, I mean, making time available is, is really key. Um, we're very lucky that the leadership team at our school give mentors a blocked off time per week for mentoring and it's, it's dedicated to that. So NQTs, when they come in to, to Middleton, they're able to have a one-to-one -one session where it might be a follow-up from like a, a lesson popping or it might be they're going to unpick a planning uh, lesson together. They're going to talk through a scenario in terms of how they could deliver a script. So the, the making time available to mentors and to the NQTs is really valuable. And we're very lucky. We've got a very accommodating timetabler who pairs up NQTs with their mentors. And the feedback that we get at the end of our programs, is, it's our strength in terms of they have a dedicated time, it's protected, and it really allows for growth within our school. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna move us on to question two, which is um, how do we understand and assess the gaps in NQT knowledge and practice and seek to close them from September? I'm gonna to go to Tanya first. And you're on mute again. <laughs> it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because you know, the, the debate is, are there really gaps there? So when we think about our trainee teachers going into the profession, and we have to remember that our NQTs are the life force of the profession, we've got a teacher retention and recruitment issue. And while we know that we've had the highest level of applications for, I think it's 10 years, but Emma has, has probably the more upstate figures on this. I think it's 10 years since we've had this 12% increase in applications. Um, at the moment, 
the resistance to employ NQTs because of these perceived gaps is a problem. And I say perceived because I said it just now, when they go through their training, their theoretical and practical grounding is constant. So it's, it's all about preparing them with the knowledge that they need to hit the ground running in September. And they get to this point by the end of the second term, which is why uh, the trainees, uh, we felt confident in passing them for their qualified teacher status without them completing their third placement. Because a third placement is an additionality. It's a, a way of applying what they've learned in the theory, in the first placement, in their praxis, to what they're going to do in another school setting. I noticed that somebody on the question and answers had asked about should new teachers have a chance to buddy up um, with external people? Well, actually, the third placement is a way of allowing them to see how other schools operate and the different cultures that David was talking about in schools and how they operate. So yes, getting other experience is really important for teachers. But actually, you can do that within your own uh, partnerships in your teaching school partnership, in your uh, MAT partnership. There will be all sorts of op op opportunities that you can utilize to fill any perceived gaps uh, within those NQTs. But as I urged before, we, do, we shouldn't be seeing this as a deficit model. We should be seeing this as an opportunity to work with NQTs that have different strengths and different resiliences. And so embrace what they bring to us and utilize what we have already in place. All the schools that I work with, and I work with a lot of schools across the country, are all getting ready to support not only their newly qualified teachers, but their early career teachers as well. And we know that the pilot is starting for the early career framework. We know the government has got a handle on how to support and uh, provide opportunities for development for early career teachers. We know that's been extended, that there's going to be 3,000 more early career teachers who are going to benefit from the early rollout. Uh, can't wait to see where they're going to be. Uh, hopefully some will come to the southwest if anyone's listening, that would be nice. Um, and then um, put that all together with what the schools do already and will be doing. I feel that it's not so much gaps, it's an opportunity for their continuing development and starting in the place where it needs to start. So they're just NQTs who've had a slightly challenging and different experience to get to the place where we need them to be, which is in the classroom. Great, thank you, Tanya. Um, Lisa? Yeah, well, first of all, I totally agree with Tanya. Um, you know, basically everything that Tanya said. Um, first of all, I think it's really important that we reframe and change the narrative. So it's not a deficit model, like Tanya said. Actually, you know, what, what are gaps anyway? You know, these NQTs are probably going to have a lot more skills than some teachers uh, like myself that have been grappling with technology over the last few weeks and doing it really badly and finally getting there. But, you know, one of the greatest strengths of schools are when they keep things fresh by having NQTs. So, you know, regardless of COVID-19, having NQTs keeps people on top of the game. It provides new insight. You know, it's a great opportunity to you know, inject some new energy into departments often, um, and they bring a fresh perspective. And I really think that that will be the same whether they have been at home for the last three months or not. I think the other thing is that depending on the NQT route, um, so whether it's PGC, SCIT, university, etc., we'll we'll also, you know, there isn't a one size fits all NQT, is there? Some NQTs will have, have actually had a lot more school time in term one and term two than others in the training year. So I think that's really important as well. And this isn't about helping people pass their NQT year. This is about playing the long game, isn't it? It's about taking these teachers, whether they've done two terms or three terms, and actually investing in them to make sure that, that they stay in the profession and they become really good um, you know, lifetime teachers that are able to, to stay in the profession and contribute. It's not about them just getting from A to B. So I think playing the long game is really important as well. Um, I think the, the other point that Tanya mentioned about, you know, often the term three is about getting a different school experience. Actually, you know, schools are all about collaboration these days with teaching schools, multi-academy trusts. There is no reason why we can't let our NQTs go and try out a different type of school. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think it's all doom and gloom at all. Great. Thanks, Lisa. 
Um, do, do you think that there is going to be um, a difference in the way that these NQTs are perceived by colleagues or potentially their schools when they enter? I think that is about us, um, you know, in, in my case with the teaching school uh, being the NQT appropriate body, in communicating really well with schools that they aren't somehow deficit NQTs. Um, and I don't think so, actually, because I think teachers that have been embedded in this last three months absolutely know that their trainees have been contributing. Um, and I guess it's just about us making sure that we're communicating that consistently so that these NQTs aren't feeling that they almost have to prove themselves even more than they would do normally, which, which could be quite um, damaging, actually. Great. Thank you so much. And Emma, I'd love to pull you into this conversation as well. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, as part of my role, for obvious reasons, I speak to lots of uh, ITT trainees, NQTs and really experienced teachers. And what's really struck me over the past couple of months as I've spoken to those different groups of people is the, um, the, the things that they're worried about, the things they're feeling are gaps are the same. And it, in, in a really strange way, we're, going, we're all novices going into September because it's an unknown world for all of us. And in some ways, I hope if there's any NQTs out there listening, you're, you're in a kind of um, strange position in that for the, for the first year ever, probably, all staff going into school are going to have the same worries and concerns that you're having. They're not different worries. We're all going in thinking, how are we going to rebuild our communities after this? How am I going to manage large scale bereavement, which is likely to happen? How am I going to help children who've lived through this trauma? How am I going to help to identify what the children need first and, and move, move away from this rhetoric of catching up? and start looking at the whole child and how can I support the whole child. These are conversations that are being had by 15, 20 year in teachers and NQTs all at the same time. And so we really are working together as a community um, and learning together as we go back. Um, I think uh, I agree with both colleagues in terms of not a deficit model at all. We have, we have entirely different skills um, that have been through, through the hard work of ITT providers in that final term have been working with ITT trainees in a completely different way um, to, to kind of um, build their knowledge, skills, understanding uh, in, in different areas as well as the areas you would expect them to. Uh, but if schools themselves can do anything, I think the thing that NQTs might be feeling most keenly going back in September is having had that time um, to build relationships with students in a sustained way for that, that final term. The key thing that we often see trainees get is they go from, from teaching uh, sort of small groups or whole class but only for one lesson to teaching much more significant chunks of time and much more significant groups of children. And it's so I think they may be feeling a little bit anxious about um, the time it, it might take them to develop those relationships. But remember, you probably felt that at the beginning of your ITT year. And I bet really quickly into that first placement, you've built fantastic relationships with those children. And that will happen in September as well. Um, and just another little thing to remember, I taught for 10 years and in my 10th year in September, I had the feeling that I'd forgotten how to teach. That happens every summer for most teachers. And the minute you get into the classroom, no matter the gap, you suddenly remember why you're there. The relationships start to build again and, uh, and, and all will be well. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I, th I do think it's important for us to, to, to challenge the narrative of gaps and we can do that in conversations like this. Um, but I think the reality is it probably has been detrimental to the uh, confidence of NQTs that are potentially entering the system. So what could school leaders um, and schools do in order to try to like boost the confidence of those NQTs when they're coming into the classrooms in September? Emma, sorry. Thank you. Um, there's, I don't think there's an easy fix to that because I think uh, Lisa mentioned earlier, there's not one size fits all. Uh, that just, just as I said, there's not one size fits all for the children coming back and we can't just decide exactly what we're going to do to, to, to bring them on. Um, every NQT is going to need something different because every NQT will have had a slightly different experience and will have different levels of confidence. Some of them may have been involved in uh, staying in school to support key worker children. Others may have been offering online lessons. Others will have been doing uh, lots of work with their ITT provider on distance learning. So they may all need something different. This isn't new. This is true even in a normal year that every NQT needs something different. 
Um, and I think with, at the risk of kind of banging the same drum, I go back to my point about getting the mentoring right, because when you have highly skilled mentors who can very quickly work with an NQT to understand what they're, um, where they're confident and where they're feeling less confident, that's when you're going to get a very bespoke program of support working rather than something generic that won't necessarily fit all of the NQTs that are coming through your doors. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move us on to the third question. Um, how can we support NQT wellbeing? So what additional pastoral support do we think they might need in order to create the conditions for them to thrive um, during but also beyond their NQT year? Um, I'd love to go to David first for this one. I think like what's really important if for the NQTs that are part of this webinar is, you know, you need to be listened and respond. You're being listened to and responded to as an ongoing basis. Don't ever think there's a question too silly, too small, you know, ask it and building on what my colleagues have been saying tonight, it's all about a school culture. So when we talk about having a, a pastoral team to help them thrive, we're all working together. So pastoral teams will be introduced in September in NQT mentor meetings through CPD. You'll be introduced to strategy. Schools have support plans in place and it's just making sure that they're shared with the NQT so it reduces any kind of fear facts you have coming in because it's in it's in the school's interest to give as much support to NQTs as possible, building on the great work that universities and the skits have done. Because the more time and moulding that we do with NQTs, we retain them in our schools and mould them into future leaders within our own schools. It's 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 in a school's interest to really want to to grow them into fantastic practitioners. Great, thank you so much. And Lisa? Yeah, so first of all, I just think it's really important that we acknowledge that actually we've, we've all suffered some kind of community trauma and everybody going back to school is going to feel highly anxious. Um, and to the NQTs, I just want you to think about anxiety. A bit of anxiety is quite good. It gets, you up at, it gets you out of bed in the morning. It keeps you on the top of your game. You know, if I'm driving somewhere, I don't know where I'm going. I get a bit of anxiety. If I'm speaking in front of a, a huge audience, I get that feeling in the pit of my stomach, dry mouth. All those kinds of things are pretty normal in terms of feeling anxiety. However, if you get to a stage where that anxiety doesn't go and come away and it's constantly there and it's actually quite debilitating, then it becomes an issue. And what I would say to you is you need to talk to somebody, your school, your friends, your mentor, your head of department, um, talk to somebody and do it soon because the, one of the biggest causes of depression actually is, is undiagnosed anxiety and unsupported anxiety. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is, is, is lots of my colleagues have mentioned today, actually you're not on your own, you are part of a profession, you're part of a team, everybody is going to be going back feeling anxious. Reach out, talk to people, you know, get in touch with your head of department, contact other people, maybe your, your um, skit director or your tutor at the university and talk to them and they will, they will talk you through it. I think my third point is that actually supporting NQTs this year in fact supporting our staff this year it is slightly different so if we've got any school leaders out there that haven't done mental health first aid I would urge you to do that because actually it is going to be different supporting our staff um, from a HR perspective and from a, um, a leadership perspective post a pandemic so if you haven't got a basic understanding of some of those issues like stress, anxiety, depression, all those kinds of things, then actually you're starting from a deficit. So I would urge you to, 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 to get um, you know, yourself up to speed with all that kind of stuff. And mental health first aid is a really nice way to do that. Um, I think the other thing is that, you know, we would do this already with NQTs, but remembering those things about, you know, buddies and peer buddies and making sure that perhaps some of those things are sorted out before September so people can be in, you know, buddy groups with, with other NQTs and, and perhaps, you know, we form a new group of NQTs at each school, don't we? Perhaps putting them in contact now would be a good idea. It might be more helpful possibly going to be less people away this summer than, than ever before um, and again just coming back to that point about the early career framework I think will be very beneficial um, particularly if it's done in a really sensitive way. Great thank you so much Lisa. Um, Tanya I'd love to bring you in here and hear what you might be doing um, within your organization in order to support ITT trainees. Um, well yeah in in what we've been trying to do is make sure that they, like Lisa said, are fully aware of the trauma that is going to be present within the schools that they're going to work in. And um, 
across Cornwall, there's been um, a big push in the last well, two years actually to uh, train trauma informed schools. So to understand how to respond to the anxiety and the needs of children who arrive unable to learn because of the trauma that they've experienced in, the, in their home space. And so actually what we've learned from that is that an expectation that children are gonna to touch the ground ready to learn is something that you can't um, be sure of and that it's a false expectation. And so I think it's reassuring NQTs that if learning isn't taking place in the way that they think it should, because that's what they've been learning it should look like, um, that's in normal circumstances. And even in normal circumstances, it's not always as you expect it to be because we don't know, and particularly in schools with high levels of persistently disadvantaged children, what their experience over the weekend or in the evening has been to get them to a place where they may not be ready to learn and how the teacher deals with that is a way of ensuring that they can learn in the future rather than perhaps learning there then and now. So I think it's about reassuring trainees now, NQTs in September, that the expectations they have are not necessarily the expectations they will meet. And so I think in all of our experiences, it doesn't matter how long we've been teaching, modifying our expectations to the reality of the experience is so important because you either end up disappointed or overexcited as a consequence of what's really going on. And so I think it's just reassuring them that we don't know what it's going to be like, but we do expect the children to come in more traumatized than they've ever been before. And that learning is likely to be less effective, particularly in the short term than it's ever been before. Um, I don't think it's helpful, again, to look at learning as something that hasn't happened during lockdown. I think, again, this is perhaps a media misrepresentation of the reality of the situation. Learning has been taking place. It's not the same as the learning that took place before. Even in school, I think colleagues will agree that the learning that's taking place for key worker children and um, vulnerable children and now for reception year one, year six, year 10 is different to what it was before. But learning is taking place and actually the soft skills learning that takes place outside of the classroom has been enhanced you know homeschooling uh, my experience of homeschooling in, in Cornwall and Devon is that the schools have made a supreme effort to ensure that their children remain engaged and support parents in the homeschooling that's been taking place and so you know I, I, I do feel that there'll be more learning that they're, than they're expecting to have taken place because the media representation is nothing's really happening um, and that we've got to really sort of focus on closing the gap. I'm not saying that the gap for the most dis disadvantaged children won't have been affected by this. All I'm saying is our expectations, we need to keep them open because we don't know what we're going to find. And then equally to that, from the school support side, when the NQTs get there, um, I've seen work quite effectively, a two tier system, and this is where ECF, ECF uh, the early career framework is going with this, is coaching and mentoring. So you have your mentor in your school who supports your expertise within the classroom and your development within the classroom. And we have to remember, all of us are a working project as teachers. You know, we could all do better. And, you know, I'm always learning. I still teach. I teach teachers. I teach school leaders. I teach trainee teachers. And I go back. I critically reflect on my practice and think, oh, actually, I think I'll do it like this next time. Nobody is ever going to be perfect all the time because people learn in different ways. And you know that what you've used uh, for one person that might be effective may not be for another. So your mentor will be really important in your school to help you understand how you'll be honing and developing your expert practice in the classroom. Your coach, and hopefully schools um, will be supporting coaching as this comes through the ECF, is your critical friend. It's your person who's there not to, I love this uh, term that um, Andy Hobson coined at University of Brighton, judge mentoring. Your coach is not there to judge mentor you and to uh, make you feel guilty about what you're not doing. Your coach is there as your critical friend to help you find your own way forward in this time of sort of stress, anxiety, and to help you build your own resilience. It's about finding in yourself ways 
because we know that our trainees are coming in with the grounding and the framework that they need but it's very easy to forget that when you're in the classroom so um, yeah two things really uh, making sure that the coaching and mentoring in school is in place and ready and and effective and um, to ensure that our trainees moving into NQTs understand that any expectations they have should be neutralized and they can actually to see what's there and go with it they have the skills to do it and they've got the community as we've we've said all my colleagues have said here the community the collaboration we're a profession teaching is a profession and if you look at the um, uh, teaching standards our first point of call is to support our pupils our students to put them first and that's what happens Thank you so much, Tanya, for that. And, and thank you so much to all of our panelists for those opening thoughts. Um, we've had a flurry of questions coming in from our audience, so um, please do keep sending your questions in through the question and answer box at the bottom. We'll try to get through as many as we can over the next um, 15 minutes. Um, firstly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with the first one, which is just a follow-up uh, for, for Lisa, actually. Um, uh, one of our panelists, uh, one of our audience members is asking if you can recommend um, how they might go about developing uh, mental health first aid um, in their school, whether or not it would be kind of through an online course or, or a provider um, in order to develop those expertise. Yeah, of course. So um, mental health first aid uh, is, a, is a course. It's normally a face-to-face -face course, but we have moved, uh, moved it to a virtual online delivery model. Um, and my teaching school uh, offers it. Um, and, you know, you, or you can go directly to Mental Health First Aid England. Um, what I would say is that some of the teaching schools that are offering it, like mine, it's being delivered by people that are mental health first trained trainers, but also people that have spent all their lives in the classroom and in a school as well. So we're able to make it real and make it relevant. So absolutely, um, you know, allianceforlearning.co.uk, look at the drop down tab under mental health and you'll, you'll see the training there. Um, and what we've done during um, this pandemic is really offer that at cost because actually we just want people to be aware. We just want to help schools help themselves. I think that, you know, the, the point that I want to make here is that yes, mental health first aid is great in terms of training, but it's also about culture. And I think, I can't remember which one of you mentioned it before. It's about school leadership team modeling, uh, you know, leaving at a reasonable time, not being a workaholic. It's about having a sensible approach to teach your workload and your marking policies and all those things that really underpin well-being, not in a tokenistic way. So, you know, it's all right having a well-being Wednesday as long as actually the rest of the stuff that goes on in school doesn't undermine all that. Great, thank you so much. Um, our next question is for Emma. Um, so obviously we've raised the importance of, of mentoring and the role that mentors can play in supporting NQTs. Um, but how can we best support mentors in their role besides just giving them some extra time? Yeah, it's time, when we, when we speak to mentors, the time and training are the two things they tell us they, they most want. Um, so it's recognition for the fact that their role is an important role and therefore, they and it, and it isn't the same as being a teacher and i think that's really important to recognize that to be an excellent mentor to be an excellent teacher educator which is ultimately what we're asking them to be they, they, it's a different set of skills and just like teaching um you, you might be naturally inclined towards being able to do it but you still need support and training and development to be able to do so so um identifying some great quality training for them and giving them the time to do that and then giving them the time within the school to, um, to work with their NQT. But also we've talked about buddying up for uh, trainee teachers and NQTs. It's exactly the same for mentors, a, a kind of uh, community of practice, being able to work with one another, um, identifying which areas of their own skills they want to develop um, and finding ways to do that. So we have an online completely free resource for mentors, which is called Teacher, Educator and Mentoring Zone, TEMS, T-E-M-Z which you can find um, on the Nasbit website. There's also Collective Ed, which is brilliant. Um, and if you go onto Twitter, I'm sure Tanya will be able to, if you follow Tanya, I know that she um, will be able to point you towards lots of great resource. There's, a, there's amazing resources out there for mentors, but what as a leadership team you need to do is, is give them the permission and the time within their own, within their working day to explore those options rather than expecting it to be something they do on a Sunday night in their own time, because that devalues devalues the role then 
um, and it stops being it starts being the thing that everybody steps back for instead of what we want, which is when we talk about we've got some great NQTs who who would like to work with them. Um, you know, my blue sky would be lots of hands up and everybody wanting to do that because they understand that that's such a valued role within the school as opposed to everybody putting their head down and thinking this is going to be something that's just going to add to my workload and I'm not I'm going to get no recognition for it. Great, thank you so much. While I've got the mic, can I just yes. very quickly give a plug to education support when we were talking about mental health? And when Lisa particularly talked about those feelings of anxiety going beyond the, the normal, comfortable um, butterflies and it becomes more of a, um, an issue that you need to talk about, absolutely use the networks that Lisa spoke about. But education support is a fantastic resource. It's free. It's a free phone line and they've got online support as well. But please do make use of that because it's there for not just for NQCs, for everybody within the teaching profession. It's a really... Um, brilliant resource and you should make use of it if, if necessary. Absolutely, I, I agree with that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, David, a question for you. Um, is there anything that you're going to do differently um, in order to be able to baseline your NQTs when they come in so that you ensure that the support you're providing from them straight from September is, is bespoke and right for the individual? Well, you're on mute, David. Going in the club. Um, I don't think that um, it's it's a baseline in really. I think what what we're looking to do from next week is we're looking to communicate with our NQTs and our mentors are, uh, are starting our we're starting the early careers framework rollout next week where the, our mentoring training is starting to come in. So my plan is to contact the NQTs and allow them you know to look at the schemes of work, meet with heads of department meet with their mentors already so they can look at and use this time to get their teeth into what they are um, going to be delivering from September so they can get use this time really to get a head start. Sometimes you know in the past NQTs have come in and they do have to hit the ground rolling the, the timetable increases from the, the training year so we're trying to use this time wisely to allow them to do some background reading on topics which they might not be comfortable with so that then when they come and work with the mentors, they would have a conversation and say, well, actually, this is a field that I feel comfortable with. Here's some resources I've created for this. However, I'm still uncomfortable or I still would like to do further reading on a certain topic. And that's where our mentors and my program and our school leaders and community can start to help fill those gaps. But that's going to be, you know, NQTs are and second year teachers and third year teachers are constantly, you know, the curriculum's changed so many times. People are always, myself included, will have to go away and read up on new topics, which I'll be delivering. So I think for NQTs to know, you know, as if you're reflective and you, you're honest with yourself on what you are, what you do consider comfortable with or something that you're going to read up on, be honest, be honest with your mentors, uh, your coaches, your professional mentor, your heads of department, so we can all work together to get to the, to, to help you prepare for September and onwards. Great, thank you. Um, this is an age old question, and actually I don't think one which is COVID um, based, um, but I think schools are taking a minute to, to take a step back and think really hard about who their mentors are in school, rather than going with the old model of, um, you're that subject, you're that subject, you're that age or phase, you're going to be um, each other's mentors. Um, so I'd love to know from Lisa and Tanya, uh, we'll start with Lisa, where do you stand on mentors outside of year groups or subjects or departments um, mentoring NQTs? So, you know, I think actually it, it really does depend. I mean, personally, I think having a subject mentor is really, really crucial, uh, particularly when, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, a knowledge rich curriculum that's really helpful but equally you know the professional mentor in the school is often not from the same subject and they add a, a rich dimension to that kind of triangle if you like uh, and a whole school approach and, and perhaps sometimes the subject mentor might not be um, you know the expert in the school on behavior so for me it's about having a blended model and it's about wrapping the support around the NQT in a bespoke way and not being fixed into rigid structures um, and, and certainly that's the way that, that we advise approaching it in, in our um, Teaching Skill Alliance. Because um, what works for one NQT, you know, your simple model of a, a subject mentor and a professional mentor might not be the case because somebody might need something specific. Um, so I'm not fixed, if, if that helps. 
great, Tanya. Uh, I agree with everything that Lisa said. Um, I've seen all the systems work in different ways. So, I, I, you know, I've been through teacher education where we've had only subject mentors, where we've only had professional mentors. I've worked in schools and colleges where they've only had professional mentors or they've only had subject mentors or they've had both. And it always should come back to the individual and the support that they need that you've identified. Um, you know, it, there's nothing that really beats doing, I hate to call it this, but a kind of skills analysis or, or a skills needs analysis of your, um, whoever your staff are actually. It's not just early career teachers or NQTs, but whoever is new to your school, talking to them in that, in that first week and finding out, you know, what is it, what areas that are there that you want to develop? You know, what do you think your needs will be this year and how can we support you in achieving those? Um, you, you do need guidance when you're starting your career on pedagogy and practice. So having somebody from outside of your subject area, they can do that equally well to somebody within your subject area. But as Lisa said, the knowledge rich curriculum <laughs> requires somebody with knowledge expertise to understand how to support your development in that, particularly as the curriculum, as David said, keeps changing so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and who knows, you know, there's talk of another Secretary of State uh, in the cabinet reshuffle. So, you know, Gavin may be out and there may be somebody else in or have another focus, we don't know. Um, so actually, in education, our priorities for curriculum change quite frequently and we respond to those changes. We're quite fleet of foot in education. Like I said, we're professionals. We see what we need to do uh, before or after the guidance comes through and we adapt and we change and we, and we deliver that in the best interest of our pupils and students. It's always about the pupils and the students at the end of the day, making sure that their experience is as good as it can be with the highest quality teachers that we can, can give them. And so I think ultimately that's what mentoring is about, is ensuring that that mentoring supports that teacher to be the best that they can be. And just to add to that, I don't think it's just about um, the mentors either. I think that that is absolutely fundamental. But for example, uh, as a fresh faced English teacher, you know, 20 years ago, the, the the best training that I had in my first year was watching other teachers teach topics and themes that I had never studied, let alone taught and do it really well. And so I think facilitating that sharing of, you know, open classrooms and things like that is really important as well. And I certainly wouldn't have got through my first couple of years if it hadn't been for my subject mentor and the opportunities to go and watch other teachers teach that, that, that were really helpful. I would agree, Lisa. Um, a, a program that I developed called Retain, which was about retaining early career teachers. Uh, when I was researching what worked for effective CPD, one of the things that really jumped out was uh, peer learning collaborations and peer learning communities. And so as part of their program, which was actually put on during the school day to give it, as, as Emma said, credibility and kudos within the school rather than just kind of tacking it on at the end of the day, you, you, don't, you don't want that bringing them together and allowing them to watch each other. They went into each other's classrooms. They became their best asset. And even now, because I've kept in touch with them and one of them's on my MA program down here in Cornwall, um, they still talk to each other about their practice and how they're developing because their, their association, their community was informal, but formal at the same time which allowed them to share things that, with each other that they wouldn't share with us for fear of judge mentoring um, as their tutors. So I couldn't agree, agree more, well, yeah. Thanks so much, Tanya. Um, actually, we've had a message from a, a new mentor who's described themselves as really excited, but really worried they're not gonna do a good enough job. Um, and they were wondering if you had any recommendations on books that they can go and buy right after the webinar finishes. Is that, is that for me? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes, there, there are lots of, of books out there. The easiest thing to do is possibly to give them a proper list of it. Um, so I'm quite happy to send through a, a book list afterwards. That said, books aren't always the best way of developing your mentoring skills. So I think books can be helpful in steering you to, to uh, try out different strategies and apply those. But actually, I think it was Emma that said it 
going on a really good coaching and mentoring course, a high quality one and learning with peers, I think is the, is the best CPD that you can have for coaching and mentoring. And I know that lots of universities, I know uh, Rachel at uh, Leeds Beckett University who runs Collective Ed, Collective Ed is doing a PGC, PG Cert in coaching and mentoring. We are at Plymouth Marge and we have done for years. Uh, in Truro, I'm running a postgraduate diploma for leading coaching and mentoring in schools that starts in October. So there, there are lots of training courses as well. There are lots of books out there and um, I'm reluctant to say one online for fear of promoting, but I'll send a list through uh, to whoever wants it. Fantastic. We can share that after the webinar. Um, and one more question for Emma and Lisa. We'll go to Emma first. Um, is there anything that governors, school governors can do or ask in order to support NQTs and early career teachers in the schools they work with? I think it goes back to asking those questions about what does our culture look like? So asking the senior leaders, what does the culture for mentoring look like? How are you supporting the NQTs? Can you evidence it? But also being the governor that goes into school and talks to the NQTs directly because they will they will be honest with you if you give them the opportunity to so ask the senior leaders question them you know make it a priority in uh, board meetings to, to always ask about how are our NQTs doing how are we supporting them how are we supporting our mentors are they well trained how do we know they're well trained how do we know they've got the skills that they should have um, but back that up by going and talking to the people on the ground and finding out what what their lived experience is and then bring that back to the boardroom and say this is what I've heard what are we doing about it yeah and I think that's absolutely right and I think you know looking at things like um you know what's the attendance like for NQTs and early career teachers you know what's this what's the retention rate like within a school you know how long are we keeping these NQTs for are we keeping hold of them or are they desperate to get out after year one um and you know asking senior staff what's the provision for NQTs and early career teachers and then like Emma said asking the NQTs and just making sure that it matches up really but in a supportive way as well. Fantastic and um, our very last question and I'm going to go to each of you um, is there anything that schools could be doing now this half term over the summer in order to just support a little an easier transition in September for NQTs? Uh, we'll start with Lisa. So for me, if I was an NQT starting a school in September, I think the nicest thing would be just a quick Zoom meeting with the head teacher to say, hi guys, you know, congratulations. It's a while since we interviewed you. It would be, you know, it's, we're really looking forward to seeing you in September, whatever that looks like. Please don't worry. We've already decided who your mentor is going to be. Here's your contact. If you need to ask me anything over the summer at all, drop me a line and I'll pick it up at some point. And just that face-to-face -face contact, because there are some NQTs that will have jobs for September that got them a few months back and, you know, time flies, doesn't it? So I think that personal touch is really important in terms of setting the tone Great, thank you so much. David? Yeah, I think that's really important what um, Lisa just said. You know, get in touch, the school get in touch with you, you get in touch with the schools, um, right, you know, either on WhatsApp, through Zoom, and just start to feel part of the community. Um, if you've got time and if the school, if your school's open, if you're available to go in and just get a feel for the building, there might be changes to it due to for, for risk assessments for COVID, uh, go and see what your potential classroom could look like, because it might not be what it would look like if it was uh, everyone coming back. Just go into your school as well and just go in and, you know, start to look at your classroom, start to feel part of that team. Thank you so much. Tanya? You're on mute again. <laughs> We'll get there. I couldn't get the cursor on it this time. <laughs> um, I think it's um, also recognising um, what really makes early career teachers leave and the research that I've done suggests it's one thing and it's about their confidence. So when they get into the classroom it's not what they thought it was going to be, their confidence dips, they feel that they haven't got the skills to cope with it. So it's about building their confidence from the beginning and I absolutely agree with Lisa and David, it's that making contact, making them feel part of the community and giving them the confidence to be able to say I'm struggling, you know I'm finding this difficult. Um, a strategy that I've seen used very well is by giving um, the newly qualified teachers coming in an early career teacher buddy. So connecting them before they start with somebody who's been in their boat only a year or two ahead of them. 
so that they can actually share their experiences and say, yeah, it was terrifying when I first got in front of my whole class, but actually it became the best experience ever having your own class. It's amazing. And so letting them talk to each other and, and create those professional learning communities and those informal networks, which will pay dividends later on, because actually it's those networks that make teachers want to stay. It's that community of practice that Emma mentioned. So yeah, my, my big tips would be how to create a culture where their confidence is being shored up and provide them with a buddy who allow, <laughs> allows them to say what's really going on and perhaps even give them the confidence to say when it's not working. I think like with Tanya's point as well, if you've, depending on your cohort, I know that we've got eight NQTs next year. So that's really exciting that there's going to be eight people that are all in the same boat that can work be working together and the CPD sessions that will be able to run with them. You know, there'll be a lot of conversations that they'll be able to have. And um, so, you know, finding out and communicating with the other people in the same position as you is also a really good way of starting for September. Yeah. I mean, I, going last of four you've all said everything that that needs to be said i think so connection in any the personal connection in any way you can whether that's face to face electronically all the different ways we've been exploring to make connections over these last few months but one really practical tip that's just occurred to me as i'm listening to colleagues speak is it's likely that your nqts may not be on your whole staff email mailing list or however you communicate to staff at this point because they're not employees yet but you are likely to be sharing your plans and your thinking for how opening is going to happen in September. So don't forget them and include them in that kind of early thinking, even if you're just thinking out loud at this point and asking for ideas, because you never know, as Tanya has said, they may come with skills and ideas and thinking that could just give you, give you a, a light bulb moment as to how something that you're struggling with could work. So include them in those discussions as well. Uh, and remember to kind of sweep them into those whole school communications, even though they're not, not officially empl employees at this point. Great. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'm going to wrap us up here and uh, thank all four of our panelists for a really fascinating discussion and, and insights into how we can support NQTs from September. Uh, key, key things that I've taken away is the very need of and needs for NQTs in September um, and actually the, the likely needs for all teachers um, and how important the role of the school is in, in supporting all educators, not only to settle in in September, but also support their well-being. Um, we'll be sharing some follow-up reading on the Ambition Institute website and our Twitter account. So please do check it out if you want to delve any further into NQT and early career teacher support. Um, you might also be interested to find out more about Ambition's early career teacher program. Uh, it's a brand new DFE funded program uh, which builds on the thinking behind the early career framework to help educators early in their career develop expertise um, and really try to support them with their well-being and job satisfaction. Uh, finally, if you enjoyed this session, why not check out the rest of our summer series? Uh, next week, we have a really exceptional double bill on the science of learning to round off our summer series. So Nick Rose will be leading a training session to introduce science of learning, which is on Tuesday. And then Paula Delaney will be doing a Zoom uh, a webinar into the theory of how memory works and how we can use this to try to support um, uh, students to make up for lost learning. So thank you very much again to our panelists and uh, for being so candid and open uh, with your responses. And thank you very much for attending our webinar.